Hi, Tatiana. Welcome. Ciao. Welcome, uh, Tatiana. Hi, okay. hi, everybody. So, everybody, uh, the beginning of the parallel session number seven at the room 2020 on data visualization, our first speaker. Welcome, Tatiana Kasiewicz, who will be talking about uh, transparent journalism to the power of R. So, Tatiana, the floor is yours. I will meow at the 10th minute to warn you that you have five minutes left. Okay? Yeah. Switching off my camera and mic, and uh, Tatiana, it's all yours. Okay, I'll just try to follow the instructions. So I'm sharing my screen. I'm turning off my camera. And okay, um, so yeah. Um, I will be talking about transparent journalism through the power of R. First of all, hi from Belgrade. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Tatiana Kacevic. I'm a data scientist with a doctorate in statistics from the University of Manchester. I'm an academic SKP with a love for teaching. I spent many years working in the UK university sector as a senior lecturer. I'm a founder of many initiatives devoted to transparent data-driven solutions to a broader spectrum of issues. Last year, I founded Sister Analysis, an organization aiming to empower women from a diverse range of backgrounds through data literacy. One of our first projects was to teach the local journalists here in Serbia how to emulate the practice of data journalism. Uh, I'm not sure, I just want to check if uh, you can hear me. Okay, sorry, I'm back to... From, oh, sorry. Okay, here we go. Uh, okay, so there is no generally accepted definition of data journalism. One of that uh, resonates the best description would be uh, the one that I'm showing here on this screen. It's the one that best describes the application of data to journalism in Serbia. Usually, uh, they're talking about the journal data journalism as requirements of new set of skills for searching, understanding and visualizing digital sources. Basic skills associated with traditional journalism are clearly no longer enough. Data proficiency is an additional and necessary asset built on the foundation of established uh, journalistic practice. I like to break those definitions in more simple terms. Data journalism is telling a compelling story with data as a source. For me, the two most important benefits of data journalism are it reveals the stories hidden within numbers, but most importantly, it helps to authenticate digital content and identify sources in order to detect manipulation. In today's world, where every piece of information becomes digitized and turned into a data source, journalists need to incorporate new practices to access this data, to encode new information configuration, and to extract meaning of the now not so novel information types. Still, for many journalists, the question is, how do I do this? Despite the digitalization of the media, data journalism in Serbia and the broader region is still uncommon. The majority of large local publishing organizations with a resource to make advantage of data applications are still failing to embrace this potential. Despite the data-related journalistic practice of top-tier publications such as the Financial Times, Guardian, The Economist, Washington Post, and other being open to reference, Serbian outlets broadly remain rooted in antiquated practices. Learning to use relevant technologies and software is a relatively simple process. Knowledge of basic programming, i.e. coding, gives journalists more independence as there is no longer need to be dependent on tech-savvy supporting actors. Becoming knowledgeable in obtaining, wrangling, exploring and visualizing data is transformative for the profession of information gathering. Still, engaging journalists with the huge potential of 
uh, offered by data analysis can be tricky. Overcoming the perception that data science is for other techie people is somewhat overmoded but still familiar attitude. One of our core aim is to counter this perception. The R Toolbox web platform uh, is a platform with a pertinent resources that when complemented with hands-on approach to teaching facilitates development of the problem-solving skills that are backdrop analysis requirement for any data journalist. Why do we advocate the use of R? Well, R together with R Studio is a great software environment for doing all sorts of data-driven journalism. It can be used for any of the stages of a typical data project, such as data gathering, wrangling, exploration, visualization, and finally reporting. It is open source and free software that is available to anyone with the desire to discover, learn, explore, experience, expand, and most, important, most importantly, share the algorithms of their data science journey. R amalgamates the learning of important and necessary data journalist skills, code writing for statistical modeling and visualization, and data reporting in a reproducible and transparent manner. Next to all those useful features, R has one of the most invaluable assets, and that is, of course, the responsive, welcoming, and inclusive community. As David Smith has pointed out in one of his revolution articles a few years ago, the R community is one of R's best features. As the novel coronavirus has reached nearly every country on Earth, there has also been mass circulation of falsehood that have spread as fast as the virus itself. The World Health Organization has described as a second disease accompanying the COVID-19 pandemic as an infodemic, which is an overabundance of information, some accurate and some not, that makes it hard for people to find trustworthy sources and reliable guidance when they need it. Journalists play a key role in providing accurate information to counter the fake news agenda. Applying data skill to support stories is what sets them apart from the purveyors of disinformation. Journalism is key to supplying credible information within the wider infodemic and to combating the myths and rumors. Because of this disinformation, transparency has to become an important part of journalists' work. It serves to increase credibility in journalism and disinformation. Transparent practice involves revealing methods and procedures of reporting. It means allowing audience an insight into how the information was obtained and verified prior to publication. I see transparency as a way to ensure a positive influence. It involves the release of information and requires an open attitude about discussions, enabling all relevant actors involved to monitor and evaluate the taken actions, not just the policy makers, but everybody influenced by them. Transparent data journalism enables clear description on how a story came about and how data was obtained and refined. A fully transparent data-driven project is a reproducible project. R serves as an effective tool for conducting data-driven project as it enables easily track the process leading from data to results so that it's fully reproducible. The R package structure is a great way to organize and share a data story. The R Toolbox course is designed to give an appreciation of R programming as a tool for data exploration. It focuses on packages that help journalists do exploratory data analysis, visualization, and communication in a dynamic and reproducible manner. It educates users in how statistical findings can be presented in a reproducible, dynamic format that cultivates the notion of transparency and engagement with actors. The material is structured within six modules that help novice data journalists, first of all, discover how to find and access data and prepare for exploration and visualization. 
introduces them to some basic statistical concepts and data types in R, and generally syntax of R. They learn to explore, visualize, and analyze data in a dynamic and reproducible manner, gain uh, experience in data wrangling, exploratory data analysis, and data visualization, and effective communication of the results. They also work on case studies inspired by real problems and based on open data. But most of all, do data journalism in a reproducible and transparent manner. Our toolbox does not just advocate the use of R for data-driven journalism, but it is truly an R project, as the pro uh, platform itself is built in R using the blog down in a transparent and reproducible manner. In its relatively short functioning, and despite the interruption in, in training caused by COVID-19 pandemic, the project has produced uh, many positive results. At the beginning of the pandemic crisis in Serbia, a group of R Toolbox trainee journalists produced an important piece that was a game changer to adopted government policy in the fight against the virus. At that point, the Serbian government was not disclosing information about available number of ventilators to its citizens. Since journalists took the initiative to obtain this information, and made it available to the public in article concerning respiratory equipment. Short, shortly after publication, the government took more serious action towards protecting its citizens against the virus. Since journalists created interactive maps informing readers of their findings. This is data democracy in action, a means of holding government to account and nudging them into action. By empowering citizens to be data informed, they're able to cut through the fog of misinformation and to have a deeper understanding of the world we live in. It means we have five minutes more for this presentation. Thank you. Okay, I will wrap it up. Since continue to apply data journalism practice as recently published an article relating to donation to local political parties for the period between 2012-2018, this is a hot topic at the moment here in Serbia as we're going to have the election uh, this Sunday. They incorporated uh, an interactive thematic map, shading the development group of the town and adding two more layers of information, i.e. attributes. The total amount of money donated, given by the size and the color of the bubble, and the amount of money received by each of the political party given through the pop-up menu. This map is truly map with uh, lots of information, so it's really rich uh, information presentation. This uh, practice clearly is an excellent example of, of effective data journalism employed as direct result of since embracing the capacity of the R toolbox. I would like to thank Internews USAID and FHI 360 for providing us with invaluable support during the course of this project. It's proving to be searching and inspiring. And of course, I would like to thank the organizer of IRAM for organizing this event and providing us with the opportunity to share our experience. If you would like to go and explore this um, platform, you can go, uh, it lives on subdomain rbine.io, it's called R Toolbox. And you can reach me on Twitter and uh, communicate with me on Slack. But uh, after this presentation, there will be a question session where I will be happy to answer any of your questions. Uh, I also have forgot to pass the link for this presentation in case anybody wants to uh, go through it. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Tatiana, for the very interesting presentation on transparent journalism through R. And I would now like to invite uh, uh, Mustafa to join us, who will be talking about elevating shiny module with uh, with tidy tidy modules. Uh, is Mustafa around this point? Hey, hi, and welcome. Hi, hi there. Hi, oh, how are you? Okay. Doing all right, how are you doing? I'm good, thank you. Good. So it's not that we have like uh, 
we are two minutes ahead of agenda. So once again, Mustafa joining us uh, to talk about elevating shining module with tidy models. My uh, Mustafa, my camera and mic is now off and the floor is yours. All right, I just have a question for you. So is it yeah, meowing up bef uh, five minutes before the end, right? Meow is five minutes before the end, exactly. All right, okay. after 10 minutes. All right, okay, thank you. Go on. Let me share my screen. Uh, So I hope you can see my screen, right? So uh, yeah, so I'm gonna be talking about a new package called Tidy Modules, which uh, has been uh, released, it's on GitHub. Uh, okay, I think I can stop my camera right now and focus on, on the presentation. Uh, yeah, so the, the title is Elevating Shiny Module with Tidy Module. Right, so um, so my name is Mustafa. I work for Novartis uh, Pharma Company, uh, whose headquarters is in Basel, and I'm myself uh, actually in Basel right now. Um, I work in a team called SEC Scientific Computing and Consulting, uh, which is part of um, the drug development part of Novartis. So. What we do in the team, basically we work in collaboration with uh, quantitative scientists, statistical methodologists, global project teams to enable the understanding on exploration of clinical trial data, resulting in more informed and robust uh, de de team decisions. So we leverage tools such as R, R Shiny, uh, web technologies like JavaScript, um, and um, hopefully we'll start doing some Python, but we don't do that much these days, even though we have some, some colleagues who do, do Python. So we build advanced visual analytics tools to dynamically and interactively explore data in collaboration with clinical teams. So uh, if you don't know what is a shiny module, well, it can be considered as a reusable building block for your shiny application. It's made of two functions, a UI function and a server function. And what tidy module is, uh, it's a kind of uh, framework structure that sits on top of shiny module. It's doing shiny module actually under the hood, right? But it gives a kind of uh, structure. Um, and it provides a, a convention um, to do uh, to do more things basically with shiny module. And uh, in the next slide, uh, uh, basically what I'm doing here, I'm comparing, you know, tidy module and shiny module side by side. So the first thing to notice about tidy module is we do R6. We do object oriented programming using R6 and we use a cementing reference as opposite to shiny module where it's two functions, it's functional programming. Uh, the next uh, thing to point out is uh, about the namespace management. Um, well, in Shiny, basically, in order to avoid collision uh, when you um, when you create two instances of the same module, you have to provide two unique identifier. Uh, with tidy module, this is optional uh, because um, it's now generating some ID for your module automatically. So you can still provide ID, but uh, that's, it is made optional right now. Um, and the next good thing about tidy module is really the, the module communication. Um, if you have been working with shiny module on many module, basically what you notice is some, it's very hard basically to manage communication across your modules because you have to, and I will show you later how we do that in shiny module on in tidy module, you have to provide some arguments to your server function. You have to collect the, the output on, yeah, do some juggling with it in order to, to have your module communicate, communicate correctly. So uh, tidy module is basically simplifying all of that for you uh, by introducing a new concept called ports. So now we have some input on output port structure uh, defined in, in, your, in, your, in your module. And I will show you that later. Uh, we have also introduced a list of 
pipes, like tidy pipes that allows you to uh, orchestrate all the communication easily in one single uh, place. Uh, on another cool thing about tidy module is every module you use or you create in your application will be rendered in a kind of a visual network. And um, this is really nice, especially if you want to to see how things work, or if you do, want to do some maintenance, on uh, show this to your users. Uh, um, another good thing about R6 is uh, this concept of inheritance from object-oriented programming. So we are leveraging that to to do uh, cool things like uh, uh, like uh, conveying the port to nested modules on the. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll show you some examples later in my second example. And the last uh, thing we can do um, is session management. Um, that's um, application. You have one single, um, it's access-based token. So this means that um, Every time, every time you access your application, it's one single session, it's a unique session. With tidy module, we we kind of um, we 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 can manage that differently. The default behavior is really to do what Shiny is doing under the hood with this token, but um, we have introduced a new way basically to to manage the sessions via tidy module. Um, and there are many, a lot of things that are still being developed actually for the module. Right, so now let's switch to the um, actually an example that I want to show you a very simple example. Um, it's taken from uh, Joe's blog on R Studio, uh, it's called the counter module. And you can find the link down below. Um, so I can show you quickly how it works. So basically, um, yeah, you have a very simple application, right? You've got the reset button. You've got the counter on the text field. On this, uh, actually, is your module. On uh, at the at the bottom, basically, we we use the the counter value here, and we add two to it. Right now, the counter is zero, so the result is zero. Zero plus two, zero. Right. If we if we add a value, you see that it's increase it's increasing. On the button here, uh, allow us to reset the counter, which is the module. On Right, this is how it works. It's very simple, okay? So the, as I said, the module is the central part here, highlighted in red. You've got the counter button on a text field. Uh, this is taking in um, uh, the action of the reset button. So it's kind of input to the module, it's in blue. And um, the output is used here to do this simple addition, adding two. It's highlighted in green. So how do we do that in Shiny, traditional Shiny, right? So we we have to function. This is our module definition, the counter button uh, module. So we have a UI function. We have a server function. Uh, and um, in the UI function, actually, what you notice is this ID. That's the identifier uh, of our module. Uh, as passed pa by the user. And uh, we will use this uh, shiny function namespace to kind of uh, create, um, create a function called ns that will allow us to, to prefix all our input, module input, with the right namespace. Okay, this is how we do shiny uh, module basically. Uh, the server function takes an additional argument. This is our, usually it's a reactive function, but I mean, you can pass anything you want to a server function, but uh, in order, it has to be a reactive function. I mean, if you if you want to handle the 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 button click here, the reset button click, and then we do our things in the server function, and then we return basically the the counter value here, and this is a reactive function again. So this is how we do it with traditional shiny. Um, now let's see how we do it with tidy module, this new framework, right? So this is the equivalent code to do it in tidy module. And the first thing you notice is actually it's longer, right? <laughs> Which can be scary for module developer. 
but um, there is a good reason for that okay so it's r6 it's an r6 class so we don't we're not dealing with two functions we are we have only one class definition it's all encapsulated um on let me just say that hopefully you can see the, the source code here. If you cannot see it, uh, I will share the, the code. It's all in um, in the, the package. So this is one of the examples from uh, the package, tidy module. But on the second example, I will show you comes also from the, the package. So you can run them. You can look at the code if you cannot read. So as I said, this is an R6 class. And we don't need to find a name for the function the ui on the server function we just need to name the class uh one class we call it counter here with a capital c this is a kind of convention for classes definition um and then another thing to notice is we are inheriting from a class called tidy module well, this is basically how you do tidy module you have to inherit from this uh, class by the tiny module package. Uh, we have our UI function defined there, and we have our server function defined there, exactly like you know, uh, uh, shiny module. But we have an additional block in um, in this initialize um, initialize function. The initialize function is something that oh. comes with R6. Oh already well okay uh, then um yeah the, the important thing is really we're defining the ports here the blue is the input the the green is the output um on the um, in the in the module definition basically we we do assign uh in the server logic uh, the output port once we we have created it right um yeah as i said it's a single r6 class no need to manage name, namespace if you look at the UI function, basically there is no ID, right? There's a clear definition on, of ports. On um, it's actually easy to have a, a module with multiple ports. We can add as many input and output ports as we want. It's all managed nicely in your in your in your module definition. Now let's see how do we use it. Um, yes, let's see how how we use it now. Uh, so on the left side we have the the shiny part um again um it's a, it's a standard shiny application the ui function the server function on as you can see uh yeah we call the each each function the ui on the on on, on the server side with the call module from shiny and uh, this is how we do it basically uh we have to provide the, the id here uh if you look at tidy module so first of all it's uh, it's roughly the same amount of code that you have to do really to use a tidy module module uh the, the only difference here is uh you instantiate your module by with this new right you create a reference if you want but this is not mandatory you can save the reference somewhere and use it uh, in your application like in the ui so we call our ui function and as i said before we don't need to provide an id this is all managed within within the class within tidy module which is really nice because um, if you see on the server, basically we don't need to provide the ID, so we can completely ignore the namespace of your module if you want. Okay. <clears throat> so um, yeah, another cool thing is really you can display the information about your module on the console. Uh, on this, we'll show you what is the namespace created by a tidy module for you. On um, we have also information about you know the ports input ports as we have defined only one input on one output they are all shown here with the the name on the um, on the other empty obviously so here we create a new one you see it's incremented and we can also if we don't save the reference basically we can look it up from the internal system because uh, what tidy module is doing is it's saving all the the module you are using in your application in uh, what you call a mod store is the kind of repository for for module that help us to generate this uh, visual network. And um, here again, we can retrieve the second one that we created. Okay. And uh, if you look closely, you see that uh, we are orchestrating the module communication via these defined edges here, and we are using some pipes. So that's something really new about tidy module. 
So it's all managed in one single place. So we don't need to pass extra parameters to server. On the, um, it's much easier to understand at the end of the day. And another thing to notice is these call modules, right? We need to call the modules, but we only need to do that once. So basically, call modules will inject the server logic of all your modules one by one because we know where they are, they are in the mod store, and um, you need to do that once, basically, in your application. Uh, here you see an example of how to use the output. Here we, we have the reference, but we could have also used the, the mod function here to, to retrieve uh, the module. OK. Uh, yeah, at the end, so you get less code needed for complex app. Your app is better organized and easier to read and maintain. OK, now I want to quickly show you another example, which is a bit more complex. And this is provided in, uh, in the package as well. So here we have uh, more modules. <laughs> the blue box here represents data wrangling modules. Uh, you see the, the ports. Yellow is output. Red is input. On the, um, yeah, they have different number of ports. Uh, this green one is a pod generator. That's another module. The gray one are basically modules. They are doing some visualization, right? Uh, you can look at this. It's in uh, the example too. So um, yeah, before moving to summary, let me just uh, show you this live. Uh, so hopefully you have an example. So this is available online uh, uh, through the package on site for tidy module. So as I said, the blue box uh, module that we are doing data wrangling. So here, the first one allows you to choose a data set available in your environment. We can stick to this one. Uh, this, this one allows you to, to map which column you want from the data set on the... So if I, if I select these uh, three columns from this hot data set provided by Plotly, um, the, this one is data filter. So basically, you could select which row you want to display in your visualization. So let's say I select this one, right? And I will show you some cool things here. So that's the plot generator, the, the green one that I showed you before. Uh, this first one allow me to select which data I want to look at. So let's say I want to see only the filter data, not the raw data. Mapping one is here. But if I add a new one, it will also show in the list here. So all the modules are connected. And um, I want to show a line plot. So as you see, that's uh, the gray um, module. On it's a yeah, very yeah. simple line plot here. OK. And we can do many other things, right? Um, I think I don't have more time. So this is all available online. And uh, the other thing I wanted to show you quickly, really, is uh, how to orchestrate the communication. Well, that's really the nice thing about the uh, tidy module. It's all done here with this pipe that you can see. So there are many pipes available, and um, it's all documented online anyway, right? Uh, OK, so now let me switch to the summary, because I think I'm running out of time. Um, yes, to summarize, yeah, tidy module just shiny under the hood. That's clear. Uh, this is a small learning curve because of R6, but it does have, offers many advantages all over uh, functional module, uh, shiny module. Okay, it does facilitate module sharing, adoption, uh, streamlines module communication, and simplify uh, code uh, for your application. I didn't show you inheritance, but there are a, a, a lot of cool things about inheritance. On the the last thing, visual network on session. Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of things. Um, maybe I will finish with this because I didn't have time to show you. But uh, basically, when you use tidy modules, uh, you generate some some uh, uh, network of your module. And this is really nice because it, it allows you to debug things on the uh, see how your application, especially if you are new to a project, it allows you to see how the application works on is connected. Uh, these are all the edges, uh, basically the, um, the connections uh, between the ports of your modules. OK. Um, with this, I, I want to say uh, thank you, obviously, to the SCC team at Novartis, my team, so scientific computing and consulting. So Douglas, Bo, Adalan, David, Flavio, our intern, and the former members of the team, so Shao, Marzi, Stefan, and Renan. And I uh, just want to say also that we are hiring. So we have a, currently an open position in Cambridge. If you're interested in uh, what we do, if you are our programmer, our shiny, even Python, we, we are 
open to any profile. So please visit the link below. I will I will put that in the chat of the station on the along with other other links. And with this, I thank you for your attention and thanks the organ organizing committee for inviting me to present tidy module. Okay, thank you, Mustafa, very much. So I would now like to invite uh, Renate, who will be sharing on interactive visualization of complex texts uh, with us. Um, sorry, but that would be not Renate, that I think is uh, someone else showing us. Hi. Hey, hi, welcome. Uh, small technical confusion anyways. Okay, so Renate, are you, are you ready for your presentation? Yes. Okay, so once again, once again, Renate talking about interactive visualization of complex texts. Uh, uh, my camera is off and my mic is off, the floor is yours. Okay, let me share the screen. So it should be working now. Yes. Then I will turn off my camera. Perfect. So I hope you can see. So thank you. We want to present to you today an interactive visualization of linguistic data using Shiny. We are really excited to show you this project because it has been on the making for a really long time, for like almost seven years. So we are Paula and Renate. We are based in Germany and we collaborate on this fun linguistic and data visualization projects when we manage the time. So at the beginning, I want to try to convince you that to actually explain to another person how to get to a particular point in space can be quite difficult and cognitively tasking. So almost uh, as difficult also as the interactional part of the, of the interaction. This is why we have some online tools that help us getting the information we need without having to speak to another human being. But if you find yourself in this situation where somebody asks your, you who, to give a root direction, what happens in your mind is the following. So first, you have to activate your cognitive map this is where you have a storage of the spatial information about your environment. You have to select the optimal route to the goal, taking into consideration at which points the other person may lose their way. Select some objects along the route that are easy to identify, to use them as landmarks. And then finally, but quite difficultly, package all the spatial information into language using words. So I have personally been working on um, root direction research for a really long time, for over 10 years. And very ironically, soon after I began, Google Maps uh, <clears throat> released in September of 2008, their first mobile app for iOS and Android featuring GPS assisted turn by turn navigation. So the first thing I learned uh, in this research was to try to not compete with Google. So, so you can get a better sense or feeling on how this works. I ask people to familiarize themselves with an environment, for example, some corridors at the university building, and uh, they should try to get this information into the metal map. In this case, this mini map on the right should be is standing for the, the cognitive map you have in your head. So what we do in the analysis is we abstract the root into this line you see at the bottom left, separating the whole root into segments depending on the physical characteristics of the segments of the root. So for example, we are now in a hole, we have to turn, then uh, we have to turn again, we can use this orange wall as a landmark, then you find a corridor, 
you have to go to a through a door, etc., until you uh, reach the final goal. So you would kind of expect people to talk about segments of the route that have the same characteristic in a similar way, right? So in this case, we're working with written route directions, so people would write a text explaining how to get to the to the goal, and I would then hand code the data into these big, sta big tables, and this is then the table is the raw data used in the visualization. So for you to understand what we are, why what we are doing is interesting and useful, I have to sadly talk to you a little bit about grammar. So we are going to do it as painless as possible. When you give a root direction, you have to first select which kind of information you want to give. So you can speak about the person who is saying where the person is located, telling the person to do some actions, or you can talk about the space. You can place some landmarks uh, in, in space or, or give characteristics of the landmarks so they can be better identified. For linguists, the most interesting stuff happens inside this action category, which is here represented by the color orange, especially when the action is to move yourself through space. So different languages have a lot of different nuanced concepts to talk about moving through space. This uh, involves, for example, giving information about the figure that is moving, something like manner of motion, which is the perspective the, the people, is, uh, the person is, is talking from, or information about the route itself. So from which source are you coming from, which directory are you taking, or towards which goal are you trying to get. So now that you selected your information, you have to package it linguistically. What do I mean by this? Imagine the situation, we have this person, the person moves, and in the end, the person is in another place. It's now inside this kind of building. How can you express this using language? One possibility would be to use a verb and say something like, enter the room. Another possibility would be to use a particle, this is something that not all languages have, but for example, German or English have them. And then you would say something like, walk into the hall. And now you have an information in your verb, which is about manner of motion, and you have the information about the direction in the particle. Then you also have the possibility to use adjuncts. This is all the other information which is not dependent of the verb, but it's like kind of an extra. So you could say, walk, to the whole, and you are giving the information about the goal in different linguistic packaging. This is still not the difficult part about this. You remember I told you for analysis purposes, we are segmenting the root in these little segments, but of course they don't exist in real life. So each speaker decides to segment the root in their own way. So some speakers can use one sentence here represented in by these lines, one sentence to talk about one segment and say something like you reach the door, or you can find one sentence talking about more than one segment at the same time, something like along the corridor to the door. And you can even find sentences that span very many segments of the route, something like you walk straight ahead, through the door, to the hall. Still, these are like the easy, straightforward examples where people actually say what they mean, but because language is a social tool, sometimes people say something and they expect you, the listener, to kind of figure out what you mean by it. So when people say something like, next comes the hall, this is a sentence giving information about a landmark, but actually, they want you to understand that it's an implied goal, like they want you to go to the hall, otherwise, they wouldn't have said this. So interesting enough in different languages, because grammars are different, have different ways they prefer to package this spatial information. This has as, a, as an, yeah, at the end, it means that people tend to describe root direction differently depending on how, uh, which language they use. So for example, German speakers prefer verbs that say some things about manner of motion, motion or they leave the verbs absolutely out. And speakers of Spanish on the other side prefer verbs that give information about trajectory or goal. 
So there is there are other people trying to find out if there are difference between men and women in how they give root direction and if these differences pertain the selection of information or the packaging of the information. So the first time we started working on, on this visualization was when I was working on my PhD thesis. So we wanted a static visualization we could print in the book. And it looked a little bit like this. So the most difficult thing here was to optimize the printing space to get as much information into the page as possible. So how did you, how did we do this? We use R and we use grid to decide how many different levels each speaker was using to explain the route and how many segments was each sentence spanning. XML and GR import to generate this kind of strings of spatial symbols that we then had to manually put together in top on top of the first script. So it was quite a lot of work, but still it was considered a success. So the end result lot looks a little bit like this, but we fairly quickly realized that it was kind of too much information at the same time. So probably the only person that could easily uh, read this representation was myself. So it was really useful for me to, to identify some language specific patterns for my dissertation, but we knew pretty soon we needed to make it interactive. So it could be also be useful for other people. So of course, this is what we had to do next, but life goes on. We were honing our skills and also the R community was moving along. So Tidyverse came along and then last year we went to PyCon X at Firenze and we decided this is the time to finish this project and hopefully be able to present it at IRAM next year. So we are really happy to be here today. What we did then was to use Shiny. In these ways, we use a much uh, less lines of codes and they have like much more functionality but of course we have to take into consideration that it's another medium so now i would like to show you how the app looks so it looks like this first you have to select which language you want to compare and then you can select which participants you want to see so for example let's here take only female participants and then you have to decide what interests you here. So for example, let's say I would like to compare which kind of information are people coding into the verbs. So I would select the relevant categories here and you will see what I told you before that German speakers tend to use a lot of verbs coding manner of motion, which is green and Spanish speaking persons prefer trajectory verbs, which are in blue or goal verbs which are in red so another thing you could do for example if you were interested in how can you encode goals in the different languages then you would select the proper channels and maybe take some more data and hopefully you can see here that the spanish text tend to contain much more reference to goals which are here represented in red so this is the way the app is working now we are quite happy about it and of course the next question is what can it be used for so the most obvious application would be in teacher teaching since i am a teaching linguistics at the university of dartmouth so the idea would be to let students explore themselves this quite complex database of linguistic data and hopefully maybe even identified new language specific patterns themselves. I also think this can help students learn to think more abstractly. This is quite difficult, especially for students who are just beginning, because uh, even though we all of us use language every day, you have to learn as a linguist to access like this meta level of language, like using language to speak about language. 
And another very nice thing is that, of course, since the Shiny app is uh, hosted online, it can also be used when a global pandemic hits the wor world and every student can access the app from their own home. So obviously, this visualization is quite uh, customized for visualizing root directions, but I wanted to give you an example that this is not necessarily the case. So just for fun, I coded the lyrics for Disney Frozen's Let It Go in German and Spanish. And then you can see, uh, or I don't know if you can see it, but it's like a linguistic nerd joke. These are actually the patterns who are fairly typical for these two languages. So it can be used for other kinds of text as long as they have spatial information in it. So if you want to contact us and have any questions, please feel free to ask now on, or contact us later. And thank you very much for your attention. So I will try now to turn back the camera. Hey, Renata, that was super, super interesting. I can tell by the comments that we are receiving. Beautiful application. Okay, so uh, our last speaker in parallel session seven on data visualization, Tobias. Tobias will be uh, talking about what's new in Shiny Proxy. Welcome, Tobias. Hello, good morning. Can, can you hear me and see me? Yes, yes we can hear can. you. We can also see you nicely. So once again, Tobias will present on what's new in Shiny Proxy. Tobias, the floor is yours. My camera goes off and the mic goes off too. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you very much uh, for the introduction, um, Goran. What I'd like to um, talk about today is what's new in Shiny Proxy. I'm Tobias Verbeek. I'm the Managing Director of Open Analytics and the core development, it's an open source project, of course, but the core development still happens um, at Open Analytics um, together, of course, with the community of increasing community or growing community of people developing Shiny Proxy. Open Analytics is a data science company based in Antwerp, um, Belgium, offering data science services going from the methodological side uh, uh, to the algorithms to development of applications for data science purposes uh, up to building entire uh, data science platforms. And when building data science platforms, Shiny apps more and more play a play a role there, and uh, that's what uh, Shiny Proxy is about. Before discussing um, about what's new in Shiny Proxy, um, yeah, I'd like to introduce you to Shiny Proxy itself. Um, what is it? Shiny Proxy is actually a framework for deploying Shiny applications and other applications, as I will show later on. Um, and primarily focusing on an enterprise context or a context of larger organizations. So larger organizations that want to restrict access to certain applications um, or certain user groups um, that want to manage the life cycle of the applications. Um, uh, they don't want that a change to one package uh, or one shiny application um, immediately affects all other applications. Uh, Things are nicely containerized in, in Shiny Proxy. Uh, we offer usage statistics in terms of security. Um, we are working um, with yeah, hospitals and, and other organizations for whom um, security and um, uh, data protection is very, very important. And these are the needs that we address with Shiny Proxy um, using cloud native technology um, with as I will demonstrate later on, uh, Kubernetes backends and so on and running on different clouds and one a very important aspect of Shiny Proxy is that it is 100% uh, open source. There are no community editions and proprietary editions um, whatsoever. There is one single edition that has all um, batteries included. Before Shiny Proxy, there was no such uh, situation. There were alternatives like the open source and pro version of, of Shiny Server. But when we started working on the product, um, yeah, we, we noticed and also our customers um, yeah, mentioned that it was or that the open source version was fairly limited, uh, no authentication, authorization, no support of SSL and so on, uh, limited concurrent use um, as well. So, um, yeah, as good open source uh, citizens, we started by looking at the source code 
of the open source Shiny server, which um, um, yeah, we thought would be a good starting point, but we discovered actually that there were yeah, deliberate efforts in that source code to restrict the functionality of the open source product. And of course, um, yeah, that's not a very good basis to build on if you know that an open source project is fighting you to, to extend it. So we started ourselves uh, building Shiny Proxy and yeah, a few months later already got quite interesting feedback from, uh, in this case, Dimitri Selivanov, who, by the way, also uh, builds nice tooling for um, R-backed APIs. Um, and he is um, yeah, quite positive about uh, Shiny Proxy. And according to him, it is, um, sorry, just checking whether people were hearing me, but according to him, it is um, yeah, at least at, at par of the other products and according to him, way ahead of Shiny Server. Um, yeah, some other people, um, of course, appreciated the fact that it was free as in free beer um, and that it could help some companies save money. But it's not only companies, actually, for the moment, um, one of the national banks in Africa is using Shiny Proxy uh, for their internal uh, purposes. There are lots of academic institutions that use Shiny Proxy. And to take a, a very current topic, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC in the United States, is also using um, Shiny Proxy. Um, um, probably more intensively than before in the in the past months. Um, maybe quickly um, show you how it um, works by going to an actual shiny proxy server uh, we've built for a, for a customer, an agency of the European Commission. Um, I log on and uh, yeah, land on a landing page with a number of shiny applications, all targeting um, risk assessment. Um, risk assessments at the EU level, for example, uh, if you want to explore outbreaks of certain diseases, there is this spatial um, application that um, that can be used. Um, and where, yeah, uh, after, I, I won't go into detail into the application, but after settings, temporal resolution, spatial resolution, and so on, um, you can start investigating, has been used, for example, for the um, outbreak um, of swine fever in the Baltic states a few years ago. Um, in my admin view, I can see that I'm not the only one using the application for the moment. So a lot of people are using this benchmark dosing application, uh, which is used uh, to test for um, toxicity of certain substances. Um, yeah, EFSA is the European Food Safety um, Authority. But back to our presentation. Um, this is yeah, Shiny Proxy in action in terms of architecture. How does it look like? One of our main design principles was that when you design an application locally, it should also run as such on the server. And um, yeah, what you see here is just uh, the, the example Shiny um, application um, running um, in an R session. Um, if we want to have exactly that same behavior, um, what we did was to containerize um, the Shiny application um, such that within a Docker container or another container, um, you can get exactly the same behavior of your app learning, running locally. Um, containerizing has um, a lot more um, other advantages. For example, the fact that you have these um, isolated environments where you can different, have different versions of R, different versions of Shiny and so on. Um, in your different applications. But this is how it looks uh, like architecturally. You have the Shiny Proxy web application that you've seen uh, when I uh, demoed it. Um, and from that web application, an API of a Docker host uh, is used to spin up containers for the end users and uh, let them use the application. Um, Shiny Proxy itself, the application, will, of course, also interact with authentication and authorization frameworks to make sure that um, you as a user um, can get access to the applications. Um, yeah, the, the creators of the apps want you to um, want you to access. So that is the, the overall um, architecture of Shiny Proxy. Um, and um, what can we add to the mix? Uh, very important for internet facing websites. The city of Boston, for example, is also using Shiny Proxy for some of their uh, applications with public data. Uh, scalability can be offered because we have this um, yeah, container backend and it can not only be a plain Docker host, but it can also be a Docker Swarm cluster 
or a Kubernetes cluster, which can auto-scale based on the number of users, hundreds, thousands, um, that are accessing your, your applications, um, typically in, in cloud environments. So that is, in a nutshell, um, what Shiny Proxy is about. Now, what is new, the real topic of the, um, uh, of the presentation? Um, it, it, it's very recent. I, I think um, um, we, we pushed this um, yesterday evening. Um, uh, to our uh, downloads section. So there is new, now a version 2.3.1. Um, you will see that the, the change logs of Shiny Proxy are, are fairly technical, like um, yeah, improved parsing of custom OpenID Connect role claims, uh, support hosting of Zeppelin notebooks, uh, set HTTP only on cookies and so on. So fairly technical. So I'll try to give you now the big lines um, in, the, in the past few releases um, to show a little bit the, the, the storylines behind all these small technical uh, improvements that we're, uh, we're making. A first uh, important one is the usage of Shiny Proxy through an API. Uh, one of the first things our customers asked for was to yeah, have custom landing pages to do branding. You've seen this landing page for the um, European Food Safety Authority with the different uh, shiny apps and their icons. So that's the first step to customize it a little bit to their needs. But people wanted more, wanted to really have shiny apps be part of their corporate portals. So they wanted to integrate shiny apps in whatever web application uh, that pre-existed. And for that reason, we worked on an, um, an API. Um, if you look at it um, technically, um, we added this little API block uh, on top of Shiny Proxy. Um, and through that API block, you can actually um, pull a Shiny application into your, programmatically pull it into your application and manipulate it using JavaScript, using whatever you want um, to position it or to use it in the way you want. So um, there is no more a need to access these applications um, from a landing page or a portal. You can really get directly to the Shiny application um, via the API, and that API can, of course, also be protected using an OAuth2 um, workflow. So that's an important um, step. And then something you will also see in these in these release notes, like uh, OpenID Connect uh, or uh, Set of Force Authn flag when using SAML authentication. Another big theme in the past few months is that through multiple uh, deployments with customers in in the Azure cloud, in AWS, on premise, and so on. Um, yeah, we had to uh, jump through a few hoops in terms of uh, authentication and authorization um, and have step by step and version to version um, increase the facilities to interact with all kinds of authentication and authorization framework. So it, it started with LDAP, uh, it was easy to extend to Active Directory um, and then moved to um, Kerberos, um, pretty old protocol, and then to the more modern protocols like OpenID. Um, or SAML 2.0, which you also uh, find a lot in the Microsoft world, um, um, hidden behind um, certain services like the Auth0 service or Cognito on AWS. Um, and then also one of the um, yeah, most important open source identity and access management systems, Keycloak. So we really worked iteration and iteration and deployment by deployment with our customers to extend this um, authentication functionality. So that um, will already account for a number of the items on the What's New page uh, for, for 2.3.1. Another important topic, um, and that's also part of uh, the many things you see here, like the HTTP only on the cookies or the possibilities to set a secure flag on the cookies, um, is that in our deployments, um, yeah, people started using it uh, for real, um, of course, on, on, on customer facing portals, um, either consumers or, or B2B, and um, started pen testing Shiny Proxy. The pen tests were done by independent parties, so independently of Open Analytics. Um, and yeah, we, we received some minor feedback um, to make sure that we would fully pass the, uh, for example, the OWASP uh, ZA proxy. Um, and added a number of um, facilities to make sure that um, yeah, Sh Shiny Proxy is, is fully pen test uh, proof. And again, remember, uh, when working with sensitive data, hospital data, um, or, or, or customer data, um, yeah, you obviously want to make sure that in terms of security, things are properly covered. 
So that's an important theme as well in the 2.3.1 release. And then um, just showing you a tweet um, with respect to another storyline, a tweet by Ivan Lung, uh, June 13, so a few days ago, uh, where he qualified uh, Shiny Proxy to be the gift that keeps on giving. Um, and let, let me explain a little bit what he means. So in, in, in Shiny Proxy, you can host uh, Shiny applications, but you can host much more than Shiny applications because there is a very generic component called Container Proxy inside Shiny Proxy that allows you to more or less proxy any uh, kind of well-behaving app. And he posted uh, a screenshot of um, um, yeah, running our studio uh, next to other Shiny apps uh, from Shiny Proxy can be yeah, very interesting, for example, if you want to directly um, run your uh, our studio uh, on, an, on a Kubernetes instance uh, and, and work on your apps in the environment in which your apps are running. So this is, um, and, and thanks for uh, spreading the word, uh, Ivan Lung, uh, but this is an example of one of the things um, uh, on the theme, a gift that keeps on giving. Um, yeah, I, I can show it here on the on the EFSA side. We also have, for example, uh, some database-backed apps um, and also proxied the client web applications for the database, in this case, RethinkDB. So as soon as your app is a little bit behaving, you can more or less proxy any web app uh, through Shiny through Shiny Proxy. Um, and yeah, Python apps written in the, in the Dash framework, for example, can equally well be hosted on uh, on shiny proxy and in that same um, thread where Ivan Lung uh, announced um, he could run our studio from within shiny proxy he also shared an example of running a streamlit app and streamlit is also um, a new kid on the block uh, to build uh, machine learning applications this is just a screenshot from their uh, from their home page uh, but all these apps can also be served by or on a single platform. So whether it is a Shiny app, a Python app in Dash or a Streamlit app, Shiny Proxy uh, can take care of that. And that extends also into notebook uh, technology. So uh, you may know the Jupyter notebooks, but there are also Zeppelin notebooks, a little bit more popular in like the big data scene um, uh, with the, the sparks uh, of this world. Um, Zeppelin. Oh. Okay, thank you. Um, um, Zeppelin uh, notebooks, um, yeah, that can equally well be integrated into Shiny Proxy. So you do not only have apps, but also notebooks run your IDE from within Shiny Proxy. And yeah, the, we did not delve into the configuration, don't have time for that. But um, similarly to adding a Python app uh, or an app, you just specify an ID, some name, um, a container image, of course, that you will run uh, for that particular application. Um, and um, yeah, some extra things if needed. You can mount volumes such that every individual user has his own um, yeah, workspace, so to speak, um, in uh, in Apache Zeppelin when when running a notebook. And that um, yeah, more or less concludes the the, the overview of the big themes um, uh, behind um, the the latest releases of of Shiny Proxy. More is coming, especially with respect to further uh, Kubernetes. Um, uh, integration and, and high availability or uh, hot loading of, of Shiny Proxy configuration. But if you um, are already interested by what is currently um, available, in order to learn more, um, you can uh, phone home on the Shiny Proxy homepage, uh, shinyproxy.io, um, where we try to uh, include all um, the things um, uh, not only we develop, but also we, we discover on, on the different deployments we do with customers and also feedback from the community that we um, try to integrate. The, the, the purpose of or the aim of the documentation is to re, be, really be um, complete um, such that you are entirely independent to set up Shiny Proxy. Um, for yourself, we have demo images uh, to show you how to package uh, a Shiny app um, uh, for Shiny Proxy, a template package, a very simple one. Um, that, that you can start from if you want to uh, run your own app. Um, configuration examples, whether you use a, a plain uh, Docker host or Kubernetes um, or a Docker Swarm, or if you want to see how to work with the custom templates, or you want to uh, have a, a little example on 
this API I mentioned that allows you to programmatically pull in Shiny apps and position them in, on your portals, all of that is available in Shiny proxy configuration examples. Um, the IDE demo uh, was actually already made um, uh, by Maxim, uh, colleague at Open Analytics, um, um, for, a, for a presentation at USR 2019, but obviously still online and ready for you to use um, the Streamlit uh, demo um, uh, by Ivan Lung is on his uh, GitHub page. Um, um, so feel free to also have a look there on how he managed to do so. Uh, the Zeppelin notebooks are again documented on the Open Analytics um, GitHub. And in general, uh, should you have uh, questions regarding Shiny Proxy or any other uh, Open Analytics um, product, yeah, there is a community support portal where we and uh, many other people in the community try to help um, other people um, regarding uh, yeah, Shiny Proxy and anything related to that. And that um, brings me to the conclusions. Um, yeah, I, I will let you draw your own conclusions uh, given the restriction on time. But should you have any questions, please um, ask them in the, in the chat of the event. Um, and um, yeah, don't hesitate to visit our portal when you are exploring the technology. So thanks a lot um, for your attention and uh, hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Okay, thank you, Tobias, very much. Uh, so uh, I imagine we will be continuing to Q and A session uh, directly from now. I am expecting the uh, speakers to join us. Thank you, everyone. This was really interesting. I can see by the comments everywhere, Slack here, social media. It's a cool session, so we can talk now. I only have uh, to share two information with you before we begin. So the first one is during the lunch break. Uh, you can find some time, go and browse the sponsor area from here. Okay, you will find it under this expo icon on the left, to the left of your Google faces and hop in. And the other important thing for the conference participants is that uh, during the lunch break, we will have a thematic lunch on building community and diversity begins at one and, and two, bring your lunch if you prefer. Okay, so back to our speakers. This was really very interesting. Once again, I've seen uh, millions of comments. So this is uh, pretty, pretty, pretty cool. And also, we have, believe it or not, but told questions on our Slack channel. I guess we are also also there. So I will begin uh, uh, going uh, per session, per talk. Okay, so uh, Tatiana, if we can, we can start with you. So uh, the first question for Tatiana from uh, Mirko Signorelli is, uh, hi Paula. Okay, so the first question for Tatiana from Mirko Signorelli. Mirko says data are nowadays everywhere in the news, often reported badly. In your opinion, should all journalists be required to follow at least a basic statistics course and maybe also to pass an exam to prove that they have a minimal understanding of the data about which they will start writing about? So a question on the qualifications of journalists in the modern data intensive environments. Tatiana, what do you think? Well, uh, clearly everybody should be data literate, literate today. Uh, in terms of journalists, well, depends how um, data analysis needs to be deeply rooted in the work they do. Uh, so my opinion is that everybody should have basic knowledge of some basic uh, stats concept and i think uh, if you're a journalist for the statistical um, uh, module that is given on our toolbox where we're talking about those basic ideas okay thank you so another question for tatiana from uh reno lieber is are you planning to expand the podcast further hmm? Yeah, uh, we currently uh, are working on uh, one on how to debunk uh, through the data the conspiracy theories, and uh, we're planning to <laughs> release that one uh, in the next few days. So, uh, yeah, we're really hoping that uh, this platform is going to provide us with creating a community with 
rich ways of <coughs> means through which we can communicate with a wider audience, not just journalists. And just now I've received another question for you uh, in the chat from Alexander Schmitz. So a question for Tatiana, do you think journalism should become open source? Well, we already have open source forms of journalism. But, uh, <laughs> Uh, well, it needs to be transparent, that's for sure. Uh, and uh, not just journalism, but just the way we're all functioning. Oh. That's the way forward. And having data as a platform, it's allowing us to do so. Okay. Thank you, Tatiana. It was very interesting. Thank you. By the way. So, uh, questions for, for Mustafa. Mustafa, are you with us? Can you hear me? Yes, I am. Hey. Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Hello. That was also quite quite an interesting talk. So uh, a few questions for you. Uh, so from Renault Lieber. So does Tidy module integrate well with the Golem package? Yes. So uh, there's no problem of using both, obviously. But uh, what Golem is doing, uh, they are providing some utility function that allows you to create um, module automatically for you right uh, so this is what we are doing in tidy module uh, we, we are also creating some um, some function that allows you to create a template for your module automatically on in future hopefully uh, yeah when people start using tidy module i think uh, golem might include that in uh, in their package directly but there is no it, it should work just fine okay thank you and now a question for you from jeremy selva so uh, Jeremy says, so the tidy module package is under the Apache license instead of uh, the GNU general license or MIT license. Can I use this package in academia works, in academic works, I guess, what about for commercial use? So a question of licenses. Uh... I think there is no problem to use it wherever you want. Just feel free to use it on sell it. <laughs> uh, I don't think there's a problem, yeah. Okay. I think we we switch it. We switch license, but um, yeah, we ended up uh, with the Apache one. Okay. So another another question from Jeremy for you. So a question is: Why is R six the new uh, uh, cluster system for us? So why is R six chosen for object oriented programming instead of S three or S four? Oh, just because I don't like S three S four. That's why. Yes. R six is actually. <laughs> Closer to Java than uh, the, the, the two others. I think it's more intuitive to start using R6. That's why I choose it. I uh, the other two. I see. Okay. Always the same with people who come from Java and Python that don't like the class system in R. So they go for R6. Okay. Uh, from Andrea Dode, if I'm pronouncing the feminine name correctly, I apologize. So thanks for the presentation coming from Flask. It's quite nice to be able to work with classes. When do you suggest to switch to tidy modules versus classic modules? So a question on transition from Flask to Python uh, uh, package. Uh, if you have any experience with that, what do you think? No, I think it's, uh, um, I don't have much experience with Flask, Python in general, but in terms of switching to tidy module, I think, you know, if you start using traditional shiny module on in complex application, you will uh, fairly quickly see limitation, especially in you know, handling the communication. So, uh, as I said, tidy module make it really easy to orchestrate, you know, all the communication for you. Um, and it's not incompatible with uh, shiny module. Basically, you can, if you have an existing application with many shiny modules, you can progressively uh, transition to tidy module. It works fine together. And um, as I said, there's just this learning curve, you know, learning R6 if you don't know it, but uh, it's a very small learning curve. Okay, thank you. And the final question for you is from Fraser Gray. Thank you for the presentation. Tidy module syntax looks like an interesting alternative. How well does tidy modules integrate with Plumber? For example, compared with the Plumber R6 shiny framework, which Alex presented us with yesterday. So I'm not sure if all of us seen the Alex presentation, but the question is definitely, I mean, the focus of the question is on the integration of tidy modules with Plumber for building APIs from R. So. Yeah, so, uh, well, a module is basically a UI on a server logic, right? But you don't need UI. You can just go for the server logic, right? So I don't see any problem there. I just want to add something that I didn't mention during my presentation. The nice thing with tidy module is you can have several representation for your module. 
I showed you there just one UI function, but you can think about having, you know, several function within defined in your in your class. That's one of uh, the other advantage actually of using 3D module. Okay, so Mustafa, once again, thank you. Very interesting presentation, very thorough answers and informative. So now questions for Renate and uh, Paula, who is her co-author and joining us now. Welcome, Paula. Uh, okay, so. Uh, so let's see. So from Federico Marini. So does this all work well with German their inversion? Yes. So I, if I understand the the question correctly, uh, Federico means that in German, in in secondary sentences or subordinated sentences, the verb is put at the end of the sentence. So in this case, the app um, does not consider the order, syntactical order of the concept, but the the subordinated subordinated clauses are marked in the visualization with dotted lines instead of continuous lines so you can see very easily which ones are the are the subordinated clauses which are the ones with the in, inversion in the verb placement okay cool so the uh, the next question is i really love how to use those more interactive approaches for science do you have experience submitting things like this to academic journals is the academic publishing industry making progress in this area? I think it's such a shame that academic papers lose out on things like this. And uh, the additional comment is I'm not in academia anymore, but I can remember reading many papers where interactive visualizations were totally helpful, I guess. Uh, so any plans, any initiatives, any chances that uh, approaches like this one will be integrated with the publishing industry? I would say that's the question. So maybe I can first respond to the first part of the question and then let Paula respond to the second part. So like in linguistics, it's kind of a, I don't know, traditional science, I guess. So they're not very open to new kind of, of visualization or, or really any kind of visualization going further than bar plots. So I actually had quite a difficult time while doing my PhD because I had a lot of a pushback from especially from my advisor and the senior scientists at the institute so they were not very big fans of this work they were constantly telling me to stop doing little drawings and con and concentrate on writing my thesis but uh, outside of linguistics i think there are many possibilities so i would like to ask paula to tell you a little bit about our plans Yes, uh, thanks, Renata. So, um, yes, I come from a, from a different science branch. So I come from uh, the, the biological sciences, where it's more common to use to use these uh, tools. And but still, uh, we're we're trying to 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 uh, revolutionize still the more traditional ground. So we we are planning to to publish uh, this app now that it's a, a more a ready like form. So we'll. We'll tell you about um, our progress uh, uh, on Twitter if if this goes through. But yes, so it, of course we need uh, some um, um, uh, uh, the journals to work with you, and at least the, the the natural sciences journals they are now providing you also with with the Git repositories where you can upload uh, things. So. Um, We'll see if we get through to the to the linguistics journals. Otherwise, we will have to go more into the to the digital humanities ones. Yes, we'll see. Yeah, thank you. So, another question for you is from Dmitro Perepolkin or Perepolkin. I'm not quite sure. So, the question is: Do you envisage application of this approach to other semi-structured environments, for example, explaining computer code or generally workflows, including project management? Well, that's interesting. Yes, this is a very interesting question, and we are really thankful for this uh, idea. So, as I try to explain, this basic idea will work with any kind of information who is strongly linearized, uh, linear, linearized in a strong way, like all information where things are coming one after the other. So, in principle, it should be able. It, it can be expanded to work for any other kind of information. Of course, you will have to adapt the relevant concept to the things you're interested in showing. Mm -hmm. Well, one thing's for sure, it's easier to parse the programming than a natural language. I guess, I mean, so it's 
Uh, it could be useful for the developers to have something like this. So a question for Jeremy Selva. Is there a small GitHub example or blog to reproduce the interactive visualizations of the frozen song text? Yeah, but it, it will be. So it's a very nice idea to make the app public and maybe we'll include a, a explanation of the linguistic concept. So like to, to make a bit of outreach. <laughs> so we'll, we'll, uh, we'll put it on uh, online as soon yeah. as possible. And the last question for you in this session from Momir Milutinovic. How did you make your application work for the other languages? Your talk was really interesting. So because, so this was, this application was born from the, from a top down perspective and not the other way around, around. like at the beginning, the idea was to compare Spanish and German because I am a comparative linguist. linguist. So the first thing I did, and this took like a long time, is like you have, I first thought of which concept would make sense and which linguistic encodes, encoding would make sense or are needed to grasp the complexity of these two languages. And the concepts available then in the app are kind of customized for German and Spanish. You can see it, for example, with these particles. They don't speak, uh, don't play any role at all in Spanish. They almost don't exist, right? So if you would like to use something similar for another language, you have to first look at the grammar of, of that language and see if some features are not needed or even if maybe other features would be really important for that particular language. Okay, thank you, Renate, and thank you, Paula, for joining us. This was really interesting. Plenty of questions. And now, uh, let me see where are we. So, questions for uh, Tobias. Okay, Tobias. Uh, mm -hmm. First question for you is from Willy Tadema, who asks Can you also deploy Plumber APIs with Shiny Proxy? A very similar question, I think, also already answered by Mustafa, right? But Probably it's it's related more to the shiny proxy product uh, than um, like can we host um, Plumber APIs? First of all, um, I think yeah, Plumber APIs are nice toys, um, are a nice addition, but I don't think that um, for really large scale deployments that they are the best solution to offer our backed um, API um, uh, mm -hmm. cons uh, consuming. So that that's the first thing. S uh, second thing um, is is there a way to use the same infrastructure on which Shiny Proxy is running to deploy um, Plumber APIs? Then the answer is yes. So um, if you go to our GitHub page and look for the Use R2019 tutorial, um, I had the pleasure to give at um, yeah, Use R2019 uh, called Docker for Data Science, then in that GitHub repository, you will find an example of deployment of Plumber APIs on a Kubernetes cluster. And typically, when you want to use Shiny Proxy for real with multiple users and, and, and scaling, that will be on a, on a Kubernetes cluster. So you can define um, um, jobs or stateful sets or all of the other relevant um, Kubernetes concepts that will take care of hosting these, these uh, APIs. But then to uh, also speak with two words if, uh, or to answer the actual question, namely, can you do it in Shiny Proxy itself? There, the answer is no, in the sense that the logic of Shiny Proxy is that a user comes with a request and launches an application, interacts with that application, um, and then that container goes down again when the user um, quits that application. So that logic um, is not really or can not easily be translated to serving APIs where you have something up and running um, all the time um, and probably multiple instances uh, being load balanced and so on. So can you do it with uh, the same technology that is underlying Shiny Proxy? The answer is yes. Can you do it within Shiny Proxy? The answer is no. Okay, thank you. So uh, next question for you is the learning curve for using Shiny Proxy seems to be very steep. Do you intend to have any course to teach people how to use it? Mm -hmm. um, well, uh, first of all, um, um, we have the intention to provide all of the information related to Shiny Proxy um, on the website of Shiny Proxy. And um, you will find the a, a getting started guide um, 
on there you will find um, a tutorial on how to deploy your apps as i've shown in my presentation there is lots of github repositories with example configurations to be used um, so there is there is a tutorial section um, but by its nature um, when you talk about the deployment of, of uh, shiny applications um, indeed you need to um, be a little bit familiar with a number of different uh, disciplines um, so knowing R obviously is good for the shiny app itself but you will need have to have some notions regarding docker um, or regarding the backends or regarding authentication um, so um, by all means if with the current documentation you uh, think things are um, not yet sufficiently uh, supported please let me know or give me specific um, examples and we'll try to improve the documentation um, but i think we cannot um, um, well, since it is about deployment we cannot avoid the deployment part um, and uh, yeah, knowing r uh, even at a very good technical level will, will not be sufficient probably to to roll out these uh, these deployments if you say yeah but i want to run i want to run shiny proxy just and only push uh, one button uh, i did not mention it explicitly but also on the open analytics docker hub um, you can find images of shiny proxy and of um, snapshot version of shiny proxy um, and there you can just run it um, um, without any additional configuration i i hope that helps uh, but again, don't hesitate to get in touch if we can improve things at that level. Okay, so uh, uh, I will, uh, uh, because we are uh, already five minutes into the lunch, I think. So, and I have plenty of questions for you. So I will fuse the following two because they seem to be very similar. So the first one mm -hmm. is from Dmitry asking, what would it take to integrate shiny proxy containers into corporate Microsoft single sign-on environments? While mm -hmm. the second one from Stuart Norris is on Azure, the question is how does Shiny Proxy performs on Azure and does it play nicely with Azure Active Directory for OTHINK, for authentications? Mm -hmm. So both um, questions for the integration with Microsoft services, what do we, what do we have on that? Okay, so um, Shiny Proxy runs very well on both AWS, Azure uh, and Google Computing Cloud. Um, I've demoed um, this shiny proxy server from uh, European Food Safety Authority um, that was running on our servers but the neck in the next iteration it will actually run within Azure using uh, Microsoft single sign-on um, technology um, so the it, it is a solved problem it is a matter of uh, properly configuring um, things um, I, I think there's also documentation on the on the shiny proxy website if you go to the tab configuration then you will find for all different authentication backends some some examples now microsoft uh, and active directory is a broad field you have uh, azure adfs you have adb2c uh, many many words covering many things uh, the identity and access management world is is quite complex um, the only thing i can say is for the moment there are um, deployments running in azure um, successfully um, um, there is also, now that I think about it, uh, from Steph Locke, uh, a repository on her GitHub uh, detailing um, how to set it up, um, I think, on, uh, on Azure. Um, so independently of Open Analytics, there is also some documentation to, um, to find on that. So yeah. I don't expect big issues. If there are, let us know. Okay, so the next question, I'm not really sure how this question is precise. So the question is, is Shiny Proxy similar to R Studio Server in the way that there are multiple applications running on one R session container? I guess the question would be, is Shiny Proxy similar to the open version of the Shiny Server, right? And uh, uh, also asking if there are global objects using in, used in a Shiny application, they're shared among many Shiny applications which might not be intended. So I guess the question is really about the comparison with what happens in the open version of the Shiny, Shiny mm -hmm. Server, or actually, okay just need to share the same object okay so what happens in that respect in shiny proxy okay so um every shiny application or every combination of a user and a shiny application will be mm -hmm. running in its own container um so yeah, if you have thousand users then you have a thousand containers uh, up and running um so if your purpose is not to share anything then by default that will be the case if your purpose is to share certain things then yeah, there are multiple solutions like mounting volumes um, 
um, um, Docker volumes, I mean, um, using database backends uh, to share state um, and so on. Um, but I think I, it's a little bit slippery because I'm not uh, not the expert on, uh, on, on, on Chinese server uh, by no means, but I think that um, one of the downsides there is that a single R process is being used or reused for um, uh, for uh, for multiple applications. It, in 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 the case of Shiny Proxy, there is a container for each user um, application combination. Okay, that so answers the question. The, 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 uh, I think so. So the, the next question uh, related to something that you've already mentioned, uh, and I also wanted to ask these things. So this is from Daniel who asks, what's a better tool for R-backed APIs than Plumber, in your opinion? Mm -hmm. If I if I remember correctly, uh, when we started the discussion, you mentioned that you're not really too happy about the way that Plumber handles the API development in R. So do you see anything as an alternative? Um, yes, I, I think, yeah, first of all, I think one should need, sorry, one should use R where R is strongest. Um, and, and I think, for example, the single-threaded nature of R makes it a little bit complex to be serving uh, hundreds of, uh, of requests from, from clients when, when serving an API. So either you have your Plumber API hosted in a container and then you make a thousand of containers and you load balance between them, that's, that's an option. Um, but I mentioned Dmitry Selivanov, who had some kind words uh, on, on Shiny Proxy in, in one of his tweets. He wrote um, a framework called, let me check, um, REST R Serve. Um, which um, yeah is um, got also some um, backing from Dirk Edelbüttel uh, regarding uh, the the hosting of uh, R-based API. So that is one option. Um, another option um, um, with a disclaimer, of course, Open Analytics made a product is a product called R Service Bus. If you navigate to rservicebus.io, uh, you will see it's a, a Java-based framework. Um, where APIs are being served and where actually the R processing happens in the back by a pool of R processes that is managed and to which all of the different requests are uh, handed over to, to yeah, fit the models. We, we've used it, for example, in real-time marketing, where within 17 milliseconds, a prediction had to be spit through a REST API. Um, so these are the, these are the two alternatives um, I know of. Uh, there may be others. Um, but so REST R serve by Dmitry Selivanov and or uh, the R service bus uh, by Open Analytics. Okay, I think we have addressed all the questions uh, following this session and during the session. So uh, this was pretty interesting, and you can also tell that by the interactions and the chat and the number of questions that we received. People were really, really interested in this. You, you guys, you, you were all great. Really, thank you. Thank you very much. So, uh, okay, so let's go uh, go to the session, grab some lunch, uh, join the others, see what's happening, take a look at the sponsor pages. Thank you for flying your room 2020. See you around. Thanks, bye. Bye-bye. You were great. See you.